right. All right. Okay. Maybe uh Good evening and welcome to the special edition of Showtime TV. I'm your host, Omar Rashida. We are here celebrating June actresses, and this is African Americans in Film and Theater. This is the topic of discussion. I have some wonderful, wonderful people here, here just tonight. Um, I have an actress, Deborah Chapman, <laughs> a filmmaker, a scholar, a teacher, director, Professor Dreher. And we have AKA, what they call him Mr. Brown. Is that Mr. Brown on the bottom with the brown, the brown shirt on? They call hey, Mr. Hey, Brown. Hey. <laughs> Marvin Chambers, <laughs> actor. And we have also a well known famous actor. He needs no introduction, Pastor Bill Wilmore Jr. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and thank you for being a guest on tonight's program. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good, good to be here. Thanks for having us. Good to have, be here. All right. <laughs> So, so um, how, yeah, okay. Okay, there's a little delay there. Okay, can y'all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Okay. All right, no. okay. So we'll start off. Go ahead. All right. No, oh, okay. I said it's just All not right. me seeing it freeze up, so. Okay. All right, yeah. well, we'll, we'll just go. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think okay. we'll, we'll keep it rolling. Yeah, we, we got to do a theater, you know, you just got to keep it going. Yep. <laughs> All right, so, so if anybody can introduce themselves and say how long they've been acting and what got them involved with acting, we'll start off with uh, Miss Deborah Chapman. Well, I've been acting since I was five, I mean, in the fifth grade, not five years old. Um, I started acting because I needed to get out of being shy. And uh, so I started singing and I started acting. And my first play was HMS Pinafore at Highlands Elementary School. And once I got over that fear of being in front of people and talking, I've been doing it ever since because it's just something I like to do for fun. Hey, I've never done it professionally. <laughs> and um, I acted in high school and in college. And I've done several plays and sang on everybody's choir that I could get into. Okay. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> okay. All right. So, Professor Dre. Well, uh, I started performing uh, at four in the black church. I mean, that is just, that's my foundation. Um, I directed choir, I um, sang in church. And so all of the confidence that I have, I, that I carry with me comes from my church community. <laughs> that's just the way it is. So, um, and I started acting really, um, it was mostly singing and performing in terms of singing. Uh, but I started really uh, acting when I got in college. When I got in college, that's when I really started getting serious about it. And then thereafter, and I stopped for a minute. Um, and then when I went to graduate st school, I acted some then. But, you know, everything started to come together here at the University of Nebraska um, oh. with filmmaking and acting and playwriting and, um, and screenwriting. Okay. Okay, uh, Maurice. Uh, well, as, as for me, um, it, it's always kind of been a, uh, and acting has always been an interest for me. Um, it was kind of like early at a young age. Um, I always had this, this mindset, I wanted to be a temptation. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah, ever since oh, I, oh, he's ever, all day. Yeah, <laughs> I was, since I was about ten years old, I wanted to go to Motown. All right. Um, you know, I, I wanted to be. My favorite was Eddie Kendricks, so I used to think I was Eddie Kendricks. <laughs> so that's that's how I started. So, and then I just I remember a, a show called. There's no show. There's no show business like. There's no business like show business. And I said that's what I want to do. So my first time being in front of an audience was, I, I believe, in fourth grade. Um, I literally, honestly, I was reading a, a proclamation, the Declaration of a Proclamation, 
and I got in front of an audience and I literally had stage fright. Mm -hmm. And I remember I couldn't, my mind just totally went blank. And the teacher came to me and said, look at something in the back of the room and focus on that and don't look at the crowd. And once I did that, all I saw was the top of the head and I floated on. And from there, that's all I remember my acting getting started. I would never look at the audience. I would always look over them yeah. until I got rid of that stage fright. Mm -hmm. And then once I got rid of it, I became comfortable standing before an audience and now I can look you right smack dab in your face. I can come off the stage and I can go to the audience now. So I'm not fearful of the audience anymore. And <clears throat> for since about 2001, I've been with Omar. And every play that I've done, basically, majority of them have been with him. And it was funny how I got started with, with Omar was I seen a flyer. And I was out one day just looking for, I was going to get some food and I stopped in this, this restaurant on Governor Prince Boulevard. And there was this notice about actors or an audition coming up. I said, I'm gonna go uh, try out for it. And I believe I tried out for the part and I believe it was Family Omar. And I was cast as, as mailman and I enjoyed it. I loved it. <laughs> and I've, I've been had I've had this fever ever since. So, and it's just something that I just went for. I enjoyed it. Um, I did a play with with this church, Cathedral of Fresh Fire, which was my former church, mm -hmm. and they had a play called The Blood. And um, I was in that. That was I, I believe it was around two thousand eight, somewhere around there, and it was at the Grand Theater. It was kind of long now, but you know you had to hang in there because it was like what almost four hours long, wow. so it needed to be toned down. But ever since oh. then, I've, I've had that the the fever, and I'm trying to grab me an yeah. agent now and, and go out there and, and you know do some things. So I got to get with my cousin there, so I can grab me an agent, and um, <clears throat> so I could you know go down and catch up with with Tyler so I can get cast in a TV show, get in one of his plays. So, and I'm gonna I'm a try to get my um, my singing voice together. So he gonna tell me, come on, sing this song for me. So, but. Oh, I'm, sorry right. I was so, I'm sorry I was so long winded, oh, but, but I get excited talking about it though. We know, OG. <laughs> <laughs> so I know, I see, I gotta get it out. All right, Pastor, how'd you get started? How'd you, how'd you get started acting? Uh, uh, actually, I'm probably uh, I'm the oldest thing in here. <laughs> I I started uh, acting in junior high school, and um, I graduated from high school in 1972. And I got my first role in the I think it was a ninth grade, and I don't even remember what it was. And uh, I was very fortunate. I got cast as uh, the lead in just about every um, play that I ever auditioned for in high school. And I just fell in love with theater. That's really, that's really my love. Theater is really my love. And I haven't done theater in a long time. But anyhow, long story short, got in the, got in the radio uh, first and um, uh, became disc jockey in 1969, got my own radio show. And, uh, and then from there, I stayed in broadcasting for number of years and uh and then um went back to acting i got cast uh as a background person and um i don't even remember the movie I, listen y'all there have been so many movies now that i can't even recall 300 stage productions over 300 stage productions but i got cast in the background in a film and that was the first experience that i had in in major motion picture work and I really fell in love with that. I really fell in love with that. Matter of fact, I do remember it was it was uh, it was called Outlaw with Jimmy Smith, and uh, it only lasted one season. And I was cast as um, background and extra, and became a uh, lawyer in the Supreme Court. Uh, and they pulled me out of the background. I got a feature role, and uh, and I just kind of you know started doing it more and more and more and more, and and. and uh, Fortunately, I was able to be uh, cast 
as a union actor many years ago, about 15 years ago, and did both Creed movies and um, got my vouchers and joined SAG. And I've been a SAG actor ever since. And uh, awesome. done a whole lot of films. And this one that I have coming up is probably one of the, the most thrilling that I, I think I, I've done in a while. And, but I still want to go back to the theater. I really do. And I'm, I'm, uh, the professor just really intrigues me about, about theater and stuff. And um, I'm hoping. And I did some theater with, with Omar. Did a show with Omar many years ago, and we we was a good scene. We got a fist fight and the whole thing. It's not for real <laughs> in the show, and uh, and he's been a great guy ever since. And I appreciate the fact that he lets me come on here. And, and well, uh, don't forget that we well, have one of us. That's right. We, my cousin and I did. We were in a <laughs> show called Justice on Trial, Black oh, Lives. Wow. Hey, yes. Travel. Oh wow! Okay. It was on tour. Um, and I traveled to so many cities. Uh, we did great shows. Some of those shows we sold out uh, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 seat auditoriums. And, um, and I did it for as long as I could do it and then came off the road. And it's still out there. It turned into a movie. Uh, Harry Lennox, um, who played um, Dresser in the Five Heartbeats, him and Chad Cooper are now partners. And so they have a film company. And, and so it became a movie. And uh, I wasn't, I didn't get cast in the movie though, so, yeah. you know. All right, uh, join us now. Uh, we have Terry Lyons. Good, good evening, Terry, how you doing? I'm doing fine. I was over in Google Meets and I was like, okay, let me come to the other side. <laughs> I was with you too. I was over there too. Were you? Okay, I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so Terry, so, so we have, we have some anybody, um, how long have you been acting and um, what got you involved with uh, wanting to be an actress? First, uh, I want to thank you for letting me uh, be on this panel. Uh, I really appreciate it. I started working with children. It was with children's theater, summer program. And I started off as being an assistant coach uh, with someone who is a theater uh, director and does a lot of acting. So I fell into it as being uh, the mother figure. You know, with a lot of children's programs, they always need the mother or the stepmother or the old lady. <laughs> that was me. And so that's where uh, it began. But after I got in the mix with it, I found that I really liked it. I had never done theater before, never had any kind of formal training before. Later, I had an opportunity to be to have um, a supporting role in a stage play called Sitting In about the sit-ins with the Greensboro Four. And so I was really serious now, you know, it was like I'm thinking I'm hitting Broadway, you know? So I went in it with that frame of mind uh, to get totally into character and to, to learn my lines and learn the blocking and the staging. And I was just, all enthralled with it. And that's where I got my start uh, uh, with theater. Not, um, I'm not in a union or anything like that because it's kind of hit and miss with me. I am primarily, I am primarily a, um, a speaker, uh, a poet and a black history teacher. So what I've done now is that I've turned theater into a learning experience with young children with the young boys, the young black boys, I wrote a play entitled A Harlem Afternoon. So these young black boys can learn about Langston Hughes and Alain Locke and, and Ralph Ellison and people they don't often get in school to mm -hmm. understand that even when we had lynching and the depression and all these different things in society going against black men, <laughs> kind of like now, uh, you had Black men who were able to put a positive influence on their community. For our young girls, we hear about Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells, Rosa Parks, God bless them, not throwing any shade on them. But we do not hear about Polly Murray, Constance Baker Motley, mm -hmm. Daisy Bates. We need to hear about these women and the significant contribution they made in modern history and how that relates to, uh, to today, not only as being 
uh, African American citizens, but also being women and how all of that comes together. So I've used play, I've used the theater uh, as a way of, of teaching uh, young people uh, to get into character of their ancestors and feel the pain, but also understand the significance of their contribution and how that applies in 2022. You know, just listening to Terry speak, uh, <clears throat> Very significant. You look at Malcolm X, uh, you look at Rosewood, you look at Harriet Tubman, you know, you look at films that were that teach us about our history, our selves, our leaders, our heroes and sheroes. So I want to start off with Professor Dreher and if anyone else want to chime in. How important is it for us, and particularly as African Americans, to go out there and, and tell our own story, whether it's television, whether it's film, whether it's theater, just to speak on the significance of us learning our stories and telling our stories. It is extremely significant. And I am so happy to hear Terry Lyon say that we need to know our other, the other, his, our, more, uh, we have so much, but we over, we churn out the same narratives, right? Um, there's an ongoing conversation about what kinds of stories we should tell. I'm sure you've heard it all yeah. about, oh, it's too many slave stories. Oh, it's, you know, we, we're always uh, talking about the pain. But within each, the, let's just go with 12 years a slave, okay? Um, there are moments of intimacy. There are moments when we are showing our compassion, our will to live, mm -hmm. right? When Solomon Northrup is hanging, you know, trying not to, to, to asphyxiate, you know, on the, with the noose around his neck, right. a black woman comes out from, from the film and yeah. gives him a cup of water. Mm -hmm. She races to him, gives him the cup of water and then runs back. I mean, that, those are the kinds of things that we did for each other. And we need to concentrate on those things. Look at the love relationship in um, A Birth of a Nation, Nate Parker's work. That, mm -hmm. that, those kinds of intimacy, talking to each other, interacting with each other, mm -hmm. you know, so putting cool. salves on the backs of our Black men and women who have been beaten. That is shown in our films. We need to see that, yeah, right? Yeah. And we also, look, let's just look at Harriet, since you bring up Harriet Tom. I mean, her father, it opens with Black love. Mm -hmm. Her father loves her. You know, her family loves her. Mm -hmm. They trust her to give her the, the playbook to the Underground Railroad. All of that is what we need to look at, right? Mm -hmm. As right. well, yes. So yes, we need those stories to show our resilience. Yes, yes. Right mm -hmm. to show how, even though we were in these kinds of time, you know, we talk about oh, our ancestors died for no. Yes, yes, they lived for us too. They yes. trusted our generation mm -hmm. to continue to birth us. Yes, to continue to birth another generation to carry on yes. that those are the stories we need to tell and yes. we need to have we don't have to feast on the ship the whip and right. the chain the auction block no, we can tell right. our stories of love yes. and intimacy mm -hmm. and strength and interactions mm -hmm. and hugging mm -hmm. each other and mm -hmm. loving each other and mm -hmm. helping each other talking to each other about how to exist within these particular kinds of, of strictures. Right. And yeah. expand yeah. that and expand that that expand that story. Let's talk about Marva Collins. I think she was a teacher yeah. in, in Chicago. I don't know. Yes, I I yes. Okay. What, what I remember about Marva Collins is that she taught students to re, to memorize poetry. Okay so that they could build the muscle for memorization. Mm -hmm. mm. That was excellent. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Omar, we need to tell our stories and there's so, but we need to expand them as well. Yes, yeah. so all the strengths. Mm. Yes. Well, one way to expand them is what I also have the students do is I ask them a question. You know, grown folks are always telling you, 
what you should and shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. If you had a chance to speak to adults, if you could speak your mind to adults, what mm -hmm. would you say? Mm -hmm. And to have them write that down, what are their joys, their angers, their frustration? What do they wish? Grown, how, how do grown folks need to get their program together in the eyes of a child and conform mm -hmm. that into just a short, not really a play, but kind of like a script, you know, because the, what I do can only be about 20, maybe 25 minutes long because of school, you know, school programs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's one way you can extend that where now the child is a part of the process. They're a part of learning and healing and expressing because what better place to express yourself than in the theater? Yeah. And showing that's, all types of strengths exactly. that people may have. I love the theater so much. It's, uh, the theater is, uh, I, I don't even know how to put it into words. It's, it's uh, Anthony Newley, said in the name of one of his shows, the roar of the grease paint was from the crowd. And uh, something about, about doing theater that lets you touch the audience. You, we can't, you, I, you, I can't do that in, in film work. I mean, we try, yes. but we really can't. I mean, you know, we in theater, we live for the applause. I mean, I literally did shows <laughs> that I, you know, you didn't get a nickel for. Uh, but the thrill of doing it and hearing the audience right. appreciate it, that was something significant. I, I remember one time doing a show, um, I was doing Fences, and, uh, uh, and they came one night and said, listen, we have a very unusual audience coming tomorrow evening, and the theater is going to be exclusively theirs, and we just got to tell you all, you know, they're all blind. And I was like, Blind? Him being a whole theater of blind folk. <laughs> what? What? And it challenged. That's not it, funny, but I hear you. Yes. It's I challenging. Guess I so we said, well, listen, let, can we go out before curtain and introduce ourselves? And uh, so they can know, kind of differentiate the voices. And, and those people at the end of the show were so appreciative. We got a standing ovation. And I literally, the whole cast, we literally stood up there. And cried like babies. They couldn't see, it. but it was like, wow, you guys appreciated what we just did, and uh, mm -hmm. that that's just that's just something extraordinary. Yeah, because you can reach people in many different ways, and that was just an excellent one for them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. right. And you know, it's the thing, right? We've heard it. Theater is therapeutic. It's cathartic. Yeah. It is. It a lot, and it's a and it's it's a hot genre, unlike film, which is cool, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's mm -hmm. just so many ways that we can express a character oh, yeah. that that gives wide berth for interpretation, right? And film easy, well, it's easier than doing theater because with film work, you know, you do, you got an A camera, B camera, you know, and you and we basically are doing one scene, pretty much two scenes, maybe three scenes a day, one right. scene take 10, 12 hours to do. And you only got to really have be off book for that one little little scene that takes a half a day to shoot it in 30 seconds on camera. Theater, <laughs> right. you know, you, you got to be on point. You, you got to be yeah, on point. You got to be on point. You know, trip to New York and you had to be, they wanted you off book by in three days or two yeah. days. You know, otherwise, he said, "Get off the stage." You know, <laughs> <laughs> <All> right, pretty much. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's so. So, tell you, you know, th think about theater. You, you, you know, or even film, but but theater in particular, Terry. Um, you know, when you're at home and when you're going over your lines, you got it just like that, right? So, when you get to rehearsal, it might be a little different story. Um, God forbid <laughs> that, that, that not forget your lines when, when, when the play actually starts in the theater, but the transition from saying your lines at home and you get it just like that, right? And like I said, so, so when you go to rehearsal, all of a sudden you, 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 you get stuck. Uh, anyone know why that is? We can start off with Terry. Anyone else who wants to chime in? Why you get stuck, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so basically I'm asking why, why is it that when you're home, 
Oh, we yeah. learn the lines and you got it. But when when you get to rehearsal, sometimes you you make it stuck. You, you don't have it like you do when you're at home. Oh. <laughs> It happens because we over process oh, it because we, you know, when you're at home, there's nobody there but you and the mirror yeah. you know, you're dealing with. And, and we get a little panicky when we have a live audience. Mm -hmm. We forget that they don't know mm -hmm. that you messed up. Unless right. they reading mm -hmm. verbatim, they don't, they don't know. And so you just got to, you know, uh, kind of go with the flow of, of what yeah. happened. I, I've had it happen where I got, I went brain dead. I just went mm -hmm. brain dead. And uh, fortunately, I was working with actors that realized, look at me and look at a deer in the headlights and say, oh, shucks. <laughs> yeah. You look. know, say something that would kind of help me, uh, you know, uh, get back and uh, tell you a true story. Funniest thing happened was, um, uh, I was doing another August Wilson uh, play, the piano lesson. And uh, we had an old fellow that played uh, Whining Boy, who was an old and drunk alcoholic. And, and he, in real life, he had, he suffered a little bit of Alzheimer's. We knew that going in. Brilliant yes. actor, a little bit of Alzheimer's. And somehow or another, he missed his cue and showed up on stage in the middle of the scene. And I was like, what are you supposed to be there? Walked out, <laughs> walked out on the stage and, uh, and I was like, oh, no. And so I said, uh, he was coming to town. He was coming in on in the, in the play. He was coming in on the train. Doker worked on the train. He was coming in that day on the train. And so the uh, only thing I could do was I looked at him and I said, whining boy, what the hell are you doing here now? <laughs> right. He was like, oh. and then I said, I think you, you were going to be here until later. And he realized. Mm -hmm. So now we've got a whole scene that we got to create to try to get out of this hole. And uh, and I finally said, "Listen, here's a couple dollars. Go down the corner and get these cigarettes." And so I got him out of there. And the director said, "Man, that was brilliant." He said, "Now mm -hmm. you all gonna have to do this every night because <laughs> now <laughs> you <laughs> created something." And every night, poor brother, he'd be somebody else. Every night, we didn't know. Uh, to today. Uh, he passed away now, but uh, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can share. Hey, yeah, I can. I, I can Maurice, share. Uh, we, we, we don't see your face. You, you're, you're, we, we, we see the iPhone, but we don't see you actually hear you, but we don't see you. I don't, uh, I don't know if you got your video, your video click on. <laughs> hey, how about you now? Oh, okay. okay. Listen, I can. You're good. You're good. I can yeah. share a little bit. What Cuz said, cuz um I remember a time that I was out there on stage and I I, rem I I knew my line, but when it came time for me to say my line, my mind just went totally blank. Mm. I couldn't remember. And it was just in the back of my mind 30 seconds ago <laughs> of, of, of my line of what to say and when to come in. But all of a sudden when the when the light hit me, my mind went blank. I couldn't remember nothing. And I kind of, I kind of just froze. <laughs> and, and, one, and, and, one of, and one of the cast members looked at me and said, you look like a deer who that, that had that, that headlights hit you. Cause I just like, uh oh, I ain't know what to do. So I just, <laughs> whatever came out, it just came out. I, I couldn't remember nothing. And every time I kept thinking, it still was like blank, like, uh-oh. So we just kept ad-libbing and saying something. Yep. Right. But we just kept, you know, letting it flow. Right. That's all you can do. <laughs> and, and, and like, he said to me, like, bruh, he said, I feel, I, I ain't know what to do, but I just had, I had to try to help you out there. But it never came back to me. Oh, wow. But it, it, and it goes back to an instance where, then I, I, I could have froze and just like stayed there and done nothing. But in the back of my mind, the whole time I'm thinking like, when you forget something, hey, just go with it. Just keep yep. the flow. Just keep right. it flowing. Yep. You know, they don't know. No, they don't. They, they <laughs> don't know. Mm -hmm. So Let's somehow we, we made it work. 
and it, it continue to flow, but sometimes it's quick. Like at the at the at a split second, it was just like totally blank. And I hope that had never happened to me again. And so far, it has never happened again. Mm -hmm. So, but things like that happen. Mm -hmm. And just remember, like, hey, if something like that happens, that's why they say somebody in that in the play or in that scene with you should know your lines or somebody mm -hmm. else's lines right. or what comes next to help you get to that line or get you back on point where you should be. Mm -hmm. So it's always crucial for each of us in a scene mm -hmm. to know somebody's lines or a portion of it to help that person in case they get sidetracked or somebody gets sidetracked to help them get back on track uh, just so we can get to the point where it brings somebody else in so it flows uh, smoothly like, like it's supposed to. But mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. appreciate, I appreciate the brother that just you know, realized that I looked, I was just frozen and my eyes got big because I ain't gonna get <laughs> it. <laughs> so I'm like, thank you. And I, I, I feel so bad because I didn't want to leave everybody else there like, well, help me out. <laughs> so <laughs> it, that's what happened. So I just wanted to share that. That's all. Hey, it happens. <laughs> yeah. I, hey, I got caught in the loop one about, time. Uh, people uh, being there for each other. Okay, go ahead. Oh, I, I, was, I got caught in a loop where okay. I repeated uh, a line that I had spoken earlier. So I didn't go blank, but for some reason, my mind went back to the top of that page where I repeated the same thing. And my opposite character was like, I told you that already. You're not paying attention to me. <laughs> so we kind of sad it that way. Girl, go back to bed and take a you want another cup of coffee. You know, so we, we worked it with that way. What helped me was that when I get a script, I'll read my line if I'm direct, particularly if it's just me a dialoguing with another character. I'll read my line, I'll record it actually. <clears throat> And I'll read the opposite person's line. I'll, I'll record the opposite person's line. And then read my line to myself silently to allow that space in the recording. Yes. Mm -hmm. So on playback, it's almost as if another person is in the room mm -hmm. saying the other line. Okay. And then I have the space to say my line. It sounds crazy, but no, that's smart. <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point because you could use that as, as, as a tool for yourself yeah. if you went while going over your line. So that's something I never thought about doing, but me maybe either. I'll start really... Yeah, so it's a, well, I mean, you're talking to yourself in a way, but <laughs> you're hey. saying the other person's line, yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of helped me get out of those. I wouldn't really go blank. For some reason, I would get caught in these loops. And, and I was like, wait a minute, I just said that. But I didn't know how to get out of it. Thank goodness my other character picked up on that. And I was like, girl, will you paint it? Will you listen to me? You know, she so she kind of reprimanded me, but it got me out of that loop. That's mm -hmm. when I began recording uh, the lines of the other character. And, and that can smooth it out. Because uh, sometimes, woo. <laughs> It happens. That's life. <laughs> One of the things you have to realize too, you're talking about when you're memorizing your line at home, right? You open, you open with that question, Omar. Um, and then when you get to the theater, it's a whole different, I mean, you forget. Oh, you have thing. to understand that environment plays a part on the body. Yeah. So when you are home, it's a whole different stage set. Yeah. And so when you get to the theater, it's like, wow. You have so much room to breathe. No, I mean, you have other people. And so it's a whole different adjustment kind of thing, which is why when I have a script, if I'm acting, I'm saying my lines, if I'm waiting in the grocery store mm. I or in the coffee house to get my lines to, to sort of myself yeah. to say, 
okay, we can say it in this environment. They have all kinds of environments. So therefore it becomes a part of muscle memory. Mm -hmm. When we were doing the Bell Affair, which we just had our premiere in Washington, DC, um, I, we did it during COVID. So I was directing actors on Zoom. You know, oh, one's in Sacramento, one's in North, no, New Jersey, one's in Texas, one, I mean, and, you know, California. So I'm directing them, right, while they're there, like we are here. Mm -hmm. And then there were times when I would zoom in and say the other person's <laughs> part so that they could say their lines, or they had the person who was recording them say the line of the other actor, right, mm -hmm. while they said their lines. You see, so I think when we are learning lines, for me, for me now, I take it like writing. I could write a draft here in my home or in my office. But, and once it moves to a whole other environment, it's a different beast. It's yeah. different. I see so many things and so many ideas come that won't come if I'm at home. That's right. Gotcha. You yeah. see, so when you take it out of its environment and let it breathe in other environments, it's much easier, I think, for the for memory, for it to move into your muscles. And so you I, can accordingly, yes. I, uh, I take, uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, when I'm not doing anything on stage or in, in camera or whatever, I pastor a church. I've pastored the same church mm -hmm. for 30 and so every Sunday, uh, I have to deliver a message, and I try to, as much as I can, not to be handcuffed to a manuscript. I try to at least mm -hmm. commit some of it to memory and try to ad lib a bunch of it. But, but I take, I don't know if anybody else ever does this, I take a, a vitamin called Ginkgo Biloma. Uh, you can buy oh. it over the. Mm -hmm. so it's a wonderful enhancement. It helps you remember things. So mm -hmm. when I have a script that's handed to me, uh, and it's a big strip. Uh, I'll start probably taking that that vitamin uh, a couple of times a day or once a day, at least two weeks before I go into production. And it helps bleed under diet. Maybe it's a hope. Maybe maybe it's a placebo. I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, you retain things. It sharpens your memory. And you go over mm -hmm. body over the counter. Nothing bad with it. Mm -hmm. Ginkgo right. Oh yeah, but this I've heard of it. Yeah. Heard of that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I use it. I use it a lot. What helps me is that I'm I'm out of when I'm not home and I'm in the environment where I'm actually doing the play or or rehearsing. I have I, that's where that character lives in my mind. So I become that character and can't be myself at that point. So that's mm -hmm. what helps me um, remember the lines. Is I'm not Debra today. I'm her. So I'm not you know, whoever my part is. And so that's how I remember the lines. I'm not be talking about myself or talking about uh, what Deborah will be doing. I'm talking about what the character is going to be doing. So that's how it helps me. I mean, that's how I make it flow. My wife yeah, will to <laughs> do certain things, certain roles, because I am I become, I have to become the character. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and so I will literally transform into that person mm -hmm. uh, and do I and I study people and this is the way this person is talk to the director what do you how do you see this character and so on and so forth and I got to literally become the character when we did finally in business uh, I was a drunk homophobic alcoholic mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and didn't shave I didn't shave for a couple of weeks didn't comb my hair and mm -hmm. I did take a bath and stuff like that but my, oh, but Bernie was not real happy with me in that. And same thing with with um, um, when I was I was uh, uh, Bono in Fences. I was a garbage man, and I went and hung out with the garbage man. Oh wow! Yay! That's, like that's into your role there. That's that's what yeah. you call a professional. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. and studied old people how they walk, mm -hmm. sit down and talk old folk because I had to be old now they cast me as old you know so uh, uh, you know my wife said you ain't got to play that you just be yourself now <laughs> I play, I play old people and crazy folk real easy <laughs> oh wow they crack in drunk they, they want me for that one big time this film that I'm doing now with Jennifer uh, and, and Common uh, uh, the earth has depleted 
is oxygen and uh, people have to move underground. And so I'm in a out shelter and uh, I'm not supposed to be there. I'm not sure how, what, what the, the director has in store for me there, but, but uh, I, I, I don't, I think I just be myself, you know, I can be myself with my hair, you know, all white hair, you know, so. <laughs> you know, speaking of roles, you know, one thing I love about acting is it's so diversified. So I want to ask each and one of you, for those who you know love the Alfred Deborah Chapman, uh, what type of roles do you enjoy doing the most? Oh, that's a good question. Um, someone who's expressive and and kind of like what I'm, the one I'm going to be doing. Someone who's just out there and, and not afraid to speak and not as afraid to speak the mind and and to show what you really believe in. That's the kind of characters I like to do. I don't like to be the submissive type. I want to be because that's how I am. In real life, I might be a little quiet and, and uh, what they call an introvert. But when I become a character that's not like that, it's more exciting for me, and I can do it better than being myself. You know, I get to be somebody that nobody ever sees. I love to play people in pain, mm -hmm. uh, either emotional pain, uh, physical pain, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, and I mean, it's easy for me to, to get into a role of transference. When I'm playing someone in pain, I have what they have called in the industry as a tear switch, and so I can pretty much cry on cue oh. um, and cut it off. You know when I need to do that. And but people in pain, my monologue for auditions, I have a monologue that I call "My Feet Hurt," and um, and it's based on uh, people with neuropathy. I have I'm a diabetic. And sometimes I have terrible, terrible pain in my feet. And, uh, and so I have a monologue called My Feet Hurt. And I have nailed, I have gotten so many roles uh, for auditions when they say, do your monologue and I'll do that feet hurt. I can promise you by the time I finish that, you're going to be crying. <laughs> so, I don't get it. <laughs> I'm so personal yeah. and so real that people are like, wow, man, wow. Yeah, I'm speechless. And uh, yeah, my feet hurt. I, I get excited when I have an audition. <laughs> yeah. You gonna do that, my feet hurt now, come on. I tell him, hold on, hold on, strap in. <laughs> I know what's gonna happen after I do it and you're gonna hear and you're gonna say, my God. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Terry? I like playing a character that carries the weight of the family. Mm. Uh, when they're going through the dark days, because mm. then I get to play the ancestors in my family. Mm. It brings back my mom and my grandmom and my elderly cousins and the strength they exhibited the wisdom that was right there and it was always on the money. Um, so I love bringing that richness to the table, to um, the play, to console who's ever in pain, to uh, give light to someone who's in the dark and to give them strength going toward the resolution um, of whatever the issue may be. I love doing that. And then the, the, the celebration or the reunion or uh, the love, you know, that, that, that comes uh, from that, the enlightenment uh, throughout the whole family that exudes through the whole family. I love, I love doing that because my hope is that it goes beyond the stage. Someone will take that home. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Awesome, awesome. Professor Dreher, is there a particular role that you like playing or is there a particular type of film that, that, that you enjoy directing the most? Well, uh, yeah, I, you know, I really enjoyed directing The Bell Affair uh, mm -hmm. and writing the, the scene. I co-wrote it with historian William Thomas and okay. um, Michael Burton uh, is our artistic director. It's just a very beautiful, beautiful film. What I loved about directing in that writing, let's just say writing for the film, for the characters, 
is that I I enjoyed I writing, writing um, intimacy for these characters. There's one scene that I wrote where Daniel and Mary Bell are talking to each other. They're enslaved people, but before they retire, they're talking about what's happening with their children. Mm. Right. Mary is saying to to Daniel, you know, that Catherine, uh, she is or uh, Caroline. I tell you, she's headstrong. Right. And he says, just like the mama, just like her mama, you know, so they're having this kind of conversation. These are enslaved people right mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. They're going for their freedom later. But I wanted to show their, how they talk to each other, how they had regular concerns mm -hmm. about their children right mary is concerned that andrew is sensitive daniel has said he can't have that kind of attitude or that kind of character in this world it's, it won't work mm -hmm. right and so you know writing for the four men in the foundry where you have one group young men in the they're all enslaved right except for one um who's saying they're saying the generation saying you better go for your freedom you better go for your freedom, Daniel. Wherein the elder Joe Thompson is saying to Daniel, petition the courts, go to the courts. Look at me, I'm free. I went to the, to the courts. Francis Scott Key was my attorney, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. writing that was so wonderful. It was just so elevated for me because it gave, it, 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 they weren't talking about, oh, massa just really working me so hard right none of that they were having conversations about freedom and you know one generation is like we're impatient we're not going to go for it you know we're mm -hmm. going for our freedom uh joe thompson is telling daniel bell petition the courts which is what he does and what our film shows is that african we're, we're basing it off the history of william thomas uh his book a question of freedom uh where daniel and mary bell petitioned the courts for their freedom Right. And when we're talking about black people petitioning the courts for their freedom, we have celebrity cases that we usually know about. Right. Mm -hmm. Plessy versus Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Dred Scott. Right. Correct. Henry Box Brown, who, you know, you know, mails himself to freedom. But what our film does, and I'm so happy to have written the, for these characters, it shows that African-Americans went to the courts. And they had white attorneys with them petitioning, right? Okay. Um, and so for me, it was directing these characters in, their, in the private spaces and in the public spaces, in their work spaces, writing for them there. But so that, that is what I did with uh, The Bell Affair. And for, now, if I had to play a character, if mm -hmm. I wanted to play a character, I would want to be that very no nonsense, tough love ancestor that's in the woods. You gotta, come, you gotta come see me, you know, for some advice. Right. Right. Just much like um, in the shooter, where they have to go see this man in the woods um, for some advice on the guns and how Tom Cruise has to go to the retired woman who's in his, her garden. Right. Right. She, he has to get, you know, that elder. If I, I want to be that elder and I want to be mean and I want to be jealous and I, because I'm older and I can't be out there with y'all. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to express that, but I see the value of you coming to me for advice. And Let so me, I, I, I give you what you need, but not before, doggone it. I give you such a hard time. Let me hear your mean. Jennifer Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> give me a taste of your mean. I like to hear mean. Oh, I, ooh. My mean? Yeah, give me some mean. Why do you want to hear my mean? What is it to you? <laughs> She's giving what does it have to do to you? Why do you want to come into my space and you want to hear my mean? Mm. That's hot. Who are you? Mm. <laughs> Chief Sturge. What do you want? <clears throat> forget it. Just forget it. I forget. She's she scared okay. me. Yes, I thank you. Scared. That is perfect. Wow. <laughs> wow. 
she did it. I was just shutting the door on you. I saw it. Give me the hand. I'm like, oh. Oh, okay. All right, Maurice. Who, who, what type of roles do you like playing? I, I, I pretty much know this. Well, I think I know. I like you. Yeah. Well, you know, you know me. I'm the, I'm the funny man. That's, that's what I want. I want the funny one. You know, I want, I want that comedic role. However, I don't want to be misunderstood as, as just being that. Mm, okay. I kind of want. At, at times, I want to kind of expand and play that serious role. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time, you know, I'll, I'll take the funny role. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do that because I like to laugh. Or I like to make that audience laugh. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember a night coming, you know, from from doing a play and, and somebody from the audience came to me and I, I, I'll never forget it and said, you was funny. <laughs> you made that play. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were others there, but just the fact that they came to me and said, oh man, you was funny. I, I love that. And it just and it did something to me. Oh, and it melted my heart yeah. and I just felt like I did my job. Yeah. I did what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I made them mad, but the fact that I got a compliment afterwards, mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't just me, it was the whole cast behind me that helped me be that person, mm -hmm. to be that character, but it just brought it out. The, the, the cast just brought it out. And like I said, just a compliment afterwards was just, you know, for me, eye-opening. Um, and, and it flooded my heart. It, it almost made me cry. I'm not going to lie. Almost made me cry. Um, but like I said, I, I, I don't want to be solely typecast as just that funny person. Mm -hmm. I do want to do, you know, I wouldn't mind doing a preacher role. I've been told time to time. You a preacher? No, I'm not a preacher, but I can do that. Um, you know, uh, right now, one of my this next role is I'm a blind man. I've never done a blind man before, but now I got to study the role. I look at Ray. I'm not gonna glue my eyes shut like like. <laughs> baby, baby. I'm, I'm not doing that. Bring your sunglasses. <laughs> yeah. I'm bringing my sunglasses, but I'm not pulling my eyes shut. I'm sorry. I'm not getting paid no money to do that. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> I, I think that's a little bit extreme. <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 your character, your, your character, uh, you wear some sunglasses. You know how some blind people wear sunglasses? Yeah, that's my business for your character. Right, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, uh, Pastor Wilmore, I, th I think your wife joined us. So is that is that Wilmore? Is, is, is this your wife? I guess she wanted to come on. I guess I'm not sure. Oh, she out there? I see her, her name's up there. Yeah, that's her. Yes, yeah. she, she's joining us. Right. So I know she got some. There she is. She this is new technology for her. She doesn't. Miss <laughs> Wilmore, how you doing? I'm doing great. I don't think I have video. You didn't I don't turn think your I camera. Have sound. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, she's on. She's on mute. Oh, there you go. We can I'm hear you now. I think you just had to. You just had to you unmute probably yourself. Probably doesn't turn the camera on. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Come out to <laughs> come, come out to the podcast and studio, and I'll, I'll show you how to how to do it. Okay. She, she's a fairly. She she has some uh, interest in uh, the arts. She doesn't uh, do it too much. It's too much of a, of a trouble for her. I took her to work one time. Um, right. The Creed, I was doing one of the Creed movies and she came and did an extra. And she said, ah, I ain't never doing this again. I feel like <laughs> you all day long, over and over and over and over like this. She liked the money, she got paid. <laughs> right, <And> right. Like, <laughs> Oh, Lordy. Got, got to meet my Buffer and a couple other people. So that was kind of, she, she said, no, she, she doesn't even, she'll come, if I'm doing a play, she'll come maybe to opening night. Maybe one or two others. And not to, I don't see her anymore. She supports me, though. She knows this is what I do. Okay. You know, what I was born to do, I believe. Amen. Amen. 
That's so well mute. Mm. All right. So, so let me throw this question. Oh, oh, yes. All right, so let me let me throw this question here. You know, when you look at once again, this is a uh, African American uh, actors and actresses. Um, so, so, so I want to ask you all. You know, you look at James Earl Jones. You look at Cecily Tyson. You look, you look at some of the pioneer actors and actresses we have in the African American community. So, I want to ask you all uh, very briefly. Uh, just talk about who are some of the, um, I guess you could say, well-known, uh, famous actors and actresses that you had come to admire over the years of your um, acting careers. Uh, we can start off with um, Deborah. Whew, that's a loaded question. I don't, there's so many that I do like. I, I don't know who's my favorite, though. Um, <laughs> I have no clue. Yeah, no clue. I, oh, no. I, thought, I, I thought everybody had a favorite. <laughs> I thought I did too, but now I can't think of a person. <laughs> That's, well, Jennifer Lewis that I brought up before, she's one of that because she's so, but I, even though I like her as an actress, I don't like the fact that everything she's in seems to be the same character. So, but I like her ability to, to um, become a character and, and express herself the way you would expect that person to um, be expressed. Um, I did like Ceci Tyson. That's another one. Um, but now I'm just a, there's my block. I, I, I can't think of names for nothing. <laughs> that's that age right. thing. Well, <laughs> I can you, see you faces, name, but I can't think some. of names. <laughs> you name some, you name some. Uh, go ahead, Terry, next. Um, growing up, I liked Gloria Foster. It was something about her, uh, something about her that I really liked. Uh, she seemed to be uh, a heavy, well-grounded, uh, assertive, self-assured. She never overacted to me, you know? Um, and Ruby D. Oh, um, so Gloria Foster and Ruby D. They they were the ones I liked just growing up. The first time I saw a black actress on television or in the movies, they were it for me. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, depending on the role, I like Viola Davis. Mm -hmm. And if I if I really want to get sassy and saucy, bring on the hot sauce and tell somebody off the way they need to be told off. Ooh. You gotta have Jennifer Lewis. Yes. <laughs> That's my girl. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> All right. Okay. <clears throat> Professor Dreyer. It has to be Cicely Tyson to me. It has okay. to be for her for me because Legend. of what Cicely Tyson did for black women in the 60s and the 70s for, with our hair. She gave us permission mm. to mm -hmm. wear our natural hair. Yeah. And, and to, when she was on the cover of Jet with those, with those braids, so nicely done, mm. that just, that really suggested so much for us, you know, mm. coming of age during that time. And then of course, to hear her, uh, okay, so that's that in terms of what she did for black women and, and hair. In terms of why she acted, it was for us. Mm. If you read about, read her autobiography or even any of her interviews, she talked about everything that she did was to uplift her race. Mm. And that the, the, the role she took was to enhance who we were, right? And who we are, right? Okay, so that's, that was, that's her work, her body of work. Mm shows that and also for her which is what i think the supremes did for black women uh, mm -hmm. the supremes not mm -hmm. diana ross and but the supremes mary wilson and, and um the others um the Lord other Ballard. well the, the other girl groups as they call them oh. right yeah oh. <laughs> what they did they she 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 when she stepped out she said this is how you should dress girls when you, not women, of course, but this is how you should look. She had her own personal designer uh, who, who, who designed her, her clothes. And if you, if you um, really, if you Google her for fashion, you will see every time we saw Cicely Tyson, she was dressed to the nines, okay? Oh, yeah. So from, from hair to style in between her work, 
and her her um, philosophy about about and also her philosophy on the power of the moving image, both in theater and in film, mm -hmm. just so compelling to me. So it it has to be Cicely Tyson for me. Okay, Maurice Chambers, who's your favorite actress or actor? I, I'm at this point. I'm not gonna really say I do have a favorite, but I, I remember um, Diane Cow mm -hmm. and Julia. Yeah, um, on that on that television show, I, I, and I kind of think for me it was. Well, I, I I didn't know what to say. Here's just black woman on TV, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And then in my eyesight, seeing Ruby D. Now Ruby D. Now I, I I forgive me, but yes, I fell in love with that woman. She was my kind of woman. Mm. She's a short woman, and <laughs> I'm sorry, this, but she was short. And I just, I, I love that about her. And she had this mild meekness about her. Yeah. It may have been mild and meek, but yet strong, right. vibrant. And mm -hmm. she took control. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was like she was just this mother figure. Mm -hmm. And she, she, mm -hmm. could, she could look at you sternly, but you knew not to do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, that husband of hers, Oh Lord, have mercy, help me. He knew not to mess with her. Who? Which he one? Knew. Which one? Monty K or the other one? Uh, with with um, I had his name on the on the tip of my tongue, but but I not but not her first one, not Monty K. No, no, okay. no. Mm -hmm. So, but he knew not to, to to mess with Ruby. He knew that. Are oh, you talking about Ozzy? Da Wait a minute. Uh, yeah, Ozzy yeah, Davis, yeah, oh, Ozzy Davis yeah. or Ruby D. Okay, Ozzy, okay. Mr. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy and Diane Carroll. Okay, I'm sorry. Ozzy Davis. That's it. Yeah. That's the name. Ozzy, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but that was a character for me. Ozzy Davis. Mm -hmm. I, I I totally did enjoy him, and he could take he could take any any role any character. Yeah. And believe me, it was just amazing just to watch him on TV or film. Mm -hmm. And and just take it to another level, and I yeah. I, I definitely did enjoy him, um, mm -hmm. but like I said, him with Ruby to him, mm -hmm. that's the icon. That's that's the family to follow right there, and, mm -hmm. and I totally enjoyed them. Um, but as far as a comedian, I got a one of my favorites was Flip Wilson. I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, Flip. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. I could yeah. see that. Yeah. Yes, I could. What he did, and he was fantastic. And he he go to doing. Now I tried to I tried to imitate him doing drugs. <laughs> no. Doing <John Dan. laughs> when he gets I see that. Into that drug, he got, it's okay. Um, and then killer. Okay, I never seen killer, but I would like Nobody to see. Nobody ever saw killer. <laughs> Hey, hey Maurice, hey Maurice, you, you know Miss Pam Greer came to Wilmington uh, a while ago. I don't oh, know yeah, if y'all know you like her. She, she came to the Wilmington Library with Miss Pam Greer. Did you like her? Oh, I love Pam Greer. That oh, was yeah. Rosie Greer's sister, I believe. Ooh. I don't think they're related. No, they're okay. not. They're related. Oh, I always thought that was his sister. But no. Pam Greer, yeah, yeah, I, I was. Oh, yeah, I love. I love me some Pam Greer too. So. Oh, yeah, that's another yeah, that's he, look, awesome. he look a little different now, cuz just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> a whole lot big, a whole lot different. Uh, the person that I uh, probably admired the most, uh, I did have a chance to meet James Earl Jones. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. And spent some time with him. And, uh, and it was interesting the day that I was with him, uh, I said, listen, can you do me a favor? I said, would you call my wife on the phone? She's a big fan. And uh, and I don't, I know we don't usually do this. And, and he said, sure. So I called, I gave him the phone and uh, he dialed a number and she answered hello. And he said, hello. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he said, who is this? Oh, this is James Earl Jones. Oh he God. said, you need to stop your lying. You ain't no dog. <laughs> I felt so stupid. 
And uh, but he he was a nice he was a nice nice man, and I always admired him because of his uh, his abilities with his voice. He was so versatile, and you know, he's a deep deep actor. I mean, he, mm-hmm. he loved theater as well. And then uh, having a chance to work with Halle Berry was like a dream. When my agent call, uh, called me, uh, sent me an email actually and said, uh, are you interested in doing a movie with Halle Berry? And I was like, you, are you, what you, why are you asking me this? And uh, she didn't really, honestly, she didn't really know who she was. She, she, she said, Helene or something. And I oh. said, who? who? And, uh, and then, <laughs> well, what is the, what is it? And she said, it's called Bruised. And I was like, Oh, oh. And so I was in Atlantic City. I had to drive to Atlantic City and I stayed down there and I, I, I did that film as a fight judge. Very nice lady. Oh, okay. Uh, got a chance to, to spend some time with her. I did a film uh, with uh, um, Lynn Whitfield. Uh, oh, wow. That's another good one. Yeah, that's another one. That yeah. was, uh, no, what was the name of that movie? The North, the North Star. Star. The North Star. Lynn Whitfield and uh, Clifton Powell. Uh, John Deal, uh, Jeremiah Trotter, who played for the Eagles at one time, was in that movie, and, and um, I got some good roles and good good lines in that movie. And probably, but one of the most my favorite in, uh, people in the industry is a guy named Maurice Smith. Uh, Maurice is from right here. He's from right here. He Maurice uh, grew up in Delaware. And I went to Delaware schools, and uh, you know Maurice as uh, from many seasons of Meet the Browns. He's clear; he was Clara's boyfriend, and uh, he's been oh. in a bunch of movies now. And uh, but he, we talk all the time, and good guy. We're we're lodge brothers, and we did um, we did uh, piano lesson. Uh, he played Boy Willie. And uh, there's another guy from Wilmington, Delaware, uh, Neil Carr, who was a big football player. Uh, Neil uh, went to Atlanta and messed around, going to auditions, and he landed some roles. And uh, he does a lot of stuff. He just finished about a two-year run uh, with uh, Sinners, Saints and Sinners, or something like that, with uh, Clifton. And Saint- uh, uh, what's it called? Yeah, Saint- Centers. Yeah, Saints and Centers and uh, big fitness guy. I got a little child now. And so, uh, so that I, you know, I've been blessed to meet a lot of great people. And uh, yeah. uh, um, Blair Underwood came here to Delaware. We did a film. Uh, we shot it right on the Market Street Mall. A lot of people didn't know about it. Yeah. But we were on Market Street Mall, and Pete DuPont and a bunch of other people came in, and I played. Uh, uh, abolitionist Harry Craig, and he played uh, William Still, and uh, oh, uh, my and Bernadette, my wife, came and got the movie. Got in the movie. The person that was supposed to play the girl didn't show up, and asked. Uh, they said, "Listen, we we had a spot, man. Can you can, can you get your wife down here?" I said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll call her. You know, I don't think she's going to do it." But she, so she came down, and I said, "Listen, Bernadette, you come down here right away." We're gonna do this film, uh, and you're gonna be in a film in the in the scene with Blair Underwood. Once again, ain't no Blair Underwood, ain't no dog on Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> and so but she showed up on the set, and now where is Blair Underwood? I said he's right here. This is right here. She said, oh my God! So here was the thing. Here's what happened. They said, listen, okay, we'll get you in the costume, took all of her makeup off, you know, and she was a runaway slave. Mm-hmm. But they said, now listen. Slaves did not have manicured nails. We're going to have to cut them off. They said, oh, no, that ain't going to happen. So they gave her a, a blanket to hold. And uh, and and because here's the thing. I, you know, I went to acting school. I did all this stuff, you know, did all these movies and things. And in that film, I have about maybe uh, a minute worth of screen time. Maybe. She, they're zooming in on her, and they're like, you know, close ups and the whole thing. I mean, it's like a couple of minutes, and she's talking with Blair. And there, <laughs> I got kind of pissed, and I said, you know, "So after that, I said, and I said, what's going on, man? What's going on?" I said, "What were you all talking about?" She said, "Oh, he was talking about his dog, and I was talking about my my family and all that." 
And she has, if you get the movie, it's called Whispers of Angels, produced by Teleduction here at Woman's Delaware, Sharon Baker. And you'll find my wife in there. Uh, and for like three minutes, nothing, just her face. Three minutes. You see me blank, I'm gone. There you go. <laughs> All right, all right, guys. So, so, so uh, we we have to close out as, as we're getting close to time. So, um, just a couple, just about two minutes each. I want each and every one of you to uh, let the viewers know <clears throat> what current projects are you currently working on. So, uh, I, don't, I don't know, Professor Dreher, are you uh, are you are you there? Or did you step out? I'm not sure. If not, we, we, we no, I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm sorry. I'm okay, right okay, my, okay. my computer froze for a minute. So what, okay, what is gotcha. the question, Omar? Okay, so, so we're closing out. So I'm giving by two minutes each just, just to say uh, what current project they're working on. Oh, okay. So we just wrapped our production company, Metal Lock Productions, just wrapped The Diary of Michael Shiner. Uh, the Diary of Michael Shiner is about an enslaved man in Washington, D.C. by the name of Michael Shiner, whose diary has been uncovered by historians. Um, my uh, production crew and I went to the Library of Congress in June um, to see the diary, and we took pictures of it and everything. And so um, we're going to do behind the scenes. That's going to be part of our behind the scenes um, filming, but we just wrapped with the diary of Michael Shiner and uh, we hope to release it uh, January, 2023. And awesome. then the next on that would be my one woman show called In a Smoke Filled Room, Color Matters. So awesome. I'm writing a grant for that production. Gotcha. Uh, so yeah, sending out a casting call. As soon as I get the budget from, um, from Metal Lock, our um, production, uh, crew, um, then I'll be able to really put the budget in and send the grant off. And so, yeah, so that's what's happening. Okay. okay. And then Terry, uh, no, no, Terry, before you talk about your current project, congratulate you. Uh, you won an award, right? Yeah, it's good. Oh, yeah. Um, Heroes of the Community Award. Oh, wow. And it's um, for people who have been of influence in their community. Uh, which kind of leads to some of the projects that I'm doing. I shared with you earlier how I'm bringing Black women uh, to the to public consciousness of, of our community that we don't often hear about. The play is entitled When the Truth Comes Out. Mm -hmm. And it's about these nine Black women. And I just mentioned some of them. It was uh, Daisy Bates, Joanne Robinson, Constance Baker, Motley, Polly Murray, among others. And the play is about an award that they receive. And it's such a prestigious award. But then, of course, you go to the after party. And it's at the after party where the truth comes out. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. <laughs> this is yeah, when wow. <laughs> and so this is when you kick your shoes off and you know, you're eating your food, don't want to get any grease spots on your good clothes. But you're talking about all what you went through. Mm -hmm. And this is when we talk about the dirt of America. So anyway, I brought that to a senior center um, and it wasn't a play, it was a script read because everyone was freaking out at, at the thought of having to memorize their lines. Oh, so I said, fine, we'll just do a script read production and they loved it. So mm -hmm. that's when I was nominated for the award uh, Heroes of the Community. Oh, wow. And uh, the summer program also bringing a children's version of that because I could change some of the language to, to, to fit with the kids um, for a summer program of When the Truth Comes Out. And then for our young men, as I explained to you before, uh, a Harlem afternoon. But what I also want to do with the Harlem afternoon is have the young men speak of uh, what is their Harlem? Oh. What is their Harlem afternoon? and somehow kind of piece that together where it can be a, a cohesive play that they wrote expressing what's in their world and what they would like to share with the world. So that's what I'm doing. I don't have a budget. I don't have a grant. I'm flat bone broke, but I have a passion for doing what I think needs to be done. Maybe keep the kids off the streets. Maybe I can save one life maybe I can reach one child. And 
That's mm -hmm. where I'm coming from. Okay. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Deborah. Yes. Um, my current one is with you, Omar. I'm doing a three men and three with three ladies. Let me get it right. <laughs> you know what I mean. Three <laughs> that's men, my three current project. Three, six strangers. <laughs> <laughs> That's my current project. I don't have any other ones going on right now. Well, what, what kind of role are you playing? What's your role? What's your character? You got to let the people know what's going on. <laughs> I am playing Miss Country because I want to have my accent all out there. <laughs> I'm going right. to be this old country lady who bossy and knows what she's doing and, and proud of what she's accomplished. Ah. <laughs> all right. Pastor Wilmore, what you doing now? I'm um, about to start uh, work production on a film called Breathe. Uh, Thunder Road Productions, uh, Jennifer Hudson, uh, Common, uh, uh, Mila Djokovic, and a bunch of other people. Um, I play a, I mean, a small, small scene, a, um, a uh, occupant of a fallout shelter and when the Earth's atmosphere and oxygen supply gets depleted. Uh, we're going to be shooting in the Philadelphia area. And by the way, if anybody is interested, uh, they are casting background people right now for that. If you want to oh, wow. be in it, you have to send your information to Harry Casting, H E E R Y, H E E R Y, Harry Casting, Harry Loft is casting in Philadelphia. And then they'll, you, on their website, it tells you how you create your account. It's a free account. And they'll tell you the roles. Uh, some of them are non union. And uh, so you just say, I'm available on the dates. And then you just sit back and hopefully wait for them to call you. Uh, it's a lot of fun. They pay you, uh, non-union people are paid about $125 a day. Mm -hmm. But it is a very long day. It's, it's 12, 13, 14 hour day. They do feed you. Uh, but uh, it's a great, and you never know. I mean, people uh, are discovered that way. And um, and you get a, they meet a lot of people in the industry and you, you know, you go to the film when it comes out and you look for yourself and maybe you see you, maybe you don't, but no, <laughs> Amen. Amen. you were there, I was there, I was there. Yes. <laughs> so many movies saying, okay, here I come. What? They cut it out. What? But you know, that was uh, me. it is what it is. That would be my luck. Huh? We say, yes. that, that would be my luck. <laughs> it happened. Uh, uh, you know, Maurice, close, close us up, Maurice. You know, All right, Maurice, well, well of, of course, my, my next project is, again, as, as Deborah is with you, uh, three men, three women, the story of our lives. So I, I don't remember my name again, but I'm the <laughs> blind man in, in the play. So, OG, OG, yeah, OG, OG. Yes. Yes. I've been calling you that all night. <laughs> okay, but I do want to say this, um, because listen, that was me. I, I had it uh, with Harry, whatever name in in Philly. Uh, we had the casting at the train station in Philly on set from 5 p.m. until 3 a.m. They fed us. Um, and like I said, my part was I was walking through the train station looking for a train. They said, that's, that's your spot. So, but of course I said, I meant it, but if you blink, you'll miss me. <laughs> so that's how it was. But anyway, I enjoyed it, but I'm going to do the next one. I'm going up there and put my name in there and make my account so I can get, get cast along with you. And Come I want to... I gotta tag along with you, cuz, cuz I, I gotta, I got, I, I, I gotta go with you, so I can start, you know, taking the taking the roles from you, cause you oh, get. Come on, man. <laughs> I don't have an agent. I don't have an agent anymore. My agent passed away. Oh, and, wow! Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, Lucy and I had been together for a long time, and she was very ill, and and uh, she didn't. I didn't know she died. I couldn't reach her. And I found out, somebody said, you know, look at this uh, funeral home. And that's when I found out she passed away. Oh, so, wow. so you can self-submit, though, to Harry Casting and all these other places. So all you, everybody who's interested in doing this film. And there's some other projects on there right now. And besides that, Servant, Four, four Seasons of Servant is on there. PAX, that's a commercial for casinos. Um, um, we just finished Hustle, 
Adam Sandler, Hustle, uh, was cast through Harry Casting. So there's always something. Keep that website always handy and look there all the time. There's always something new. Can you give me that website again, please? H-E-E-R-Y, Harry Loftus Casting in Philadelphia. Do this, uh, Terry. Uh, if you send me a, a text message, I'll send it back to you. Here's my here's my um, uh, uh, email. Uh, D as in David, A as in Adam, R as in Robert, E as in Edward, V as in Victory, the number three at yahoo.com. And send me that. And, uh, and Professor, uh, please remember me. I'd love to work with you. Thank you. Me too. Me too. Me too. Me too. Where, now, where are you located? I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska. We're right okay. in the middle of the country. I wrote no. down your email. I wrote it down. And come, um, come if I, yeah, I mean, we could do it even. We did all of the filming of the Michael Shiner diary on, on Zoom. Wow. On Zoom. Every, everything on Zoom. Um, so, um, I bring a girl with me. I got to look. I can get on a plane in a heartbeat. I got ways to go. I can travel now. I'm okay. <laughs> great. So, Ready so uh, if I need anything, I can call. I can get in contact with Omar. Omar has yeah. all of the information, uh, so it's no worries. Quick, okay. Let's see. This is safe to do it. There's not. I mean, okay, so I'm gonna give you all, all everybody my phone number and not give it because there's not a lot of people out here. Three zero two eight nine eight. 0592, that's my cell phone, and call me. I keep it with me 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I need that email too, there, cuz. Hold on. Send me. Oh, hey, yeah, well, I All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll hook everybody up. I'll hook everybody up. So we'll be uh, good. So Tom is go. expiring. Tom is expiring. Thank you all for coming on. Please like, subscribe, and um, we all gonna stay in touch with one another. All right. Okay. Thank you all for being a guest so on the night. Meeting program. everybody. Uh, Thank you. Y'all too. Have a good okay. one. Thank, Thank you, y'all. Okay.